We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Before we study Exodus chapter 20, verses 24 through 26, as I read, I want to get the context. I know that God's love for his people is beyond comprehension. And as his people were in Egypt for years, as God had led them, Joseph in, and knowing that a famine was coming and using Joseph to protect his people and to appeal to the Egyptians of who the true God is, God delivered them because God is the deliverer. In the book, Patriarchs and Prophets, Page 305, it says, he whom they had already known as their guide and deliverer, who had brought them forth from Egypt, making a way for them through the sea, and overthrowing Pharaoh and his hosts, who had thus shown himself to be above all the gods of Egypt. Because of God's love for his people, he delivered them mightily. He brought plagues to try to appeal to the Egyptians to show them who the true God is, and they refused to submit themselves to God and the God of heaven. He then finally got his people out, and he brought them there before the Red Sea, and what did he do? He parted the Red Sea. Now, let me just tell you a story. This wasn't... I was... I used to... I, got a, I have a previous degree at University of South Florida in Tampa, and I had to take a Bible, a Bible class at a secular school. It was quite interesting. And um, I was just sort of coming in back to the church, and the professor was very blasphemous. He, he, he would call this the Bibble and bring, take out your Bibles, and he would just sort of... Um, uh, sort of use the Bible and God sort of like in a very happenstance, not very reverent way, and it was very disturbing. And he began to explain to the class, who I'm sure the majority of them were not really believers and took their relationship with God seriously. He said that uh, what we read in the account, it wasn't really uh, the Red Sea, as they say. You know, it was really a, a place where uh, it was just sort of ankle deep that they sort of walked through and, uh, and so forth like that, and he was just completely dis- dis- the grid. But the, the st- there was a story, funny enough, is that there was a man reading the Bible, and he got to this point in the Bible where God, where, where God opened up the Red Sea, and he was like, wow, this is incredible, God's power, how could God do this? And there was a man there who said, well, you're reading the Bible? I mean, this is a, a fictional book, this is a, a joke, and you can't believe any of those stories in there. I mean, how, how can God open up the Red Sea like this and be walls of um, water on each side and they're walking on dry land? I mean, this was, this was just a little, little, little river here that maybe went up knee height and it just, you know, happenstance and they walked through and the guy was like, whatever. And he began to walk away and the guy said, wow, wow, God is even more powerful than I thought. And the guy said, what happened now? And he says, man... Man, God is even more powerful. I mean, he, he just drowned a whole army in a foot of water. God did not part a foot of water. He parted the Red Sea. And he leads them out. And he wants to draw him, them to himself. He wants to do what? Draw them. To, now, listen now. How many years had his people been slaves in Egypt? About 400 years. Now, were, were the Egyptians a God-fearing society, or were they pagans and worshipped many gods and idols? They worshipped everything, right? They worshipped the sea, red, the Nile, everything, everything. So God's people had been entrenched in this paganistic, idolatrous society for about how many years? Close to 400 years. And ha- have they, had they lost sight of... Uh, who the true God was and the worship and all. Do you think they lost sight of that a little bit? Yes. And God was trying not to lead them to himself and begin to show them again who he was. Again, Patriarchs and Prophets, page 364, we're told, through long intercourse with idolaters, 
the people of Israel had mingled many heathen customs with their worship. Therefore, the Lord gave them at Sinai definite instruction concerning the sacrificial service. And that's where I want to get to. Go to Exodus chapter 19. You see, God's people had been so entrenched in this idolatrous society that they had lost sight of who God was, how much he loved them, how much God wanted for them to worship him and, and witness to others and serve him, that he had to show them again, really, what kind of God he was. Now, as we're turning to Exodus chapter 19, let's go there first. We know that before God led them out of Egypt, he gave them an amazing ordinance called the Passover, right? And that Passover was is that an animal had to be killed, an unblemished animal, and they had to take the blood and put it on the doorpost, right? Okay, again. And therefore, those who had put the blood on the doorposts were saved through the blood of the Lamb. What was God trying to teach them right there that they were to be saved by the blood of the Lamb, right? He's teaching them things already. Directing them to the true God and who he is, his love for them. And then we come to Exodus 19. He, he gave them that already to begin to let them begin to understand how they are to be saved by the blood of the Lamb. We come to Exodus 19 and we're in chapter verse 16. And say amen if you're there. And look what happens here. It says, then it came to pass on the third day in the morning that there were, what's the word? There were thunderings. Hold on to that word. What's the word? Thunderings. And what's the next word? Lightnings. Hold on to these words. You're going to see them again. Just stay with me. So again, it came to pass on the third day in the morning that there were thunderings and lightnings and a thick cloud on the mountain, and the sound of the trumpet was, was very loud, so that all the people who were in the camp trembled. And Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet with who? With God, and they stood in the foot of the mountain. Verse 18, now Mount Sinai was completely in smoke because the Lord descended Upon it in fire, his smoke ascended like the smoke of a furnace, and the whole mountain quaked greatly. I'm about to show you that God brought his very throne room down to this mountain. He descended upon his people. He came down. He came what? He came down. Now, we saw there that when God came down on the mountain, there were thunderings. What's the word? Thunderings. What else did we see? Start with the L. Lightnings, and there was great noise, and, and it trembled. Yes or no? Now, it's on the screen here. Now, when we come to Revelation chapter 11, verse 19, look what it says when we are introduced into the very throne room of God. It says, Then the temple of God was opened in heaven, and the ark of his covenant was seen in his temple, and there were lightnings and noises, and what else? thunderings, and an earthquake, and great hail. These are the same descriptions we see at Mount Sinai. Why? What is it saying? That God descended and brought his very throne room down on that mountain to meet with his people. Can you say amen? That the God of the universe comes down. He comes what? Comes down. And he gives them the sanctuary, which, interesting enough, It says that Jehovah revealed himself not alone in the awful majesty of the judge and lawgiver, but as the compassionate guardian of his people. And when he gave them the sanctuary service and all the furnishings in there, he said that you shall make it as a pattern as you saw to Moses. Do you know that verse? Okay. And interesting enough, when you put all the furnishings as they are, it actually gives us an outline of the cross. What was God trying to instill in his people? That salvation was through him alone. 
Now, in the idolatrous um, hedonism type of um, societies, um, salvation and appeasing God is what they would do, right? And they would do all sorts of crazy things. But God here descends on the mountain and begins to reveal to them that salvation is through him alone. You see, salvation is through Christ alone, mankind's only hope and savior. And God wanted them to understand that they could do nothing to save themselves. Now, look what he does next. This is incredible. We're in Exodus chapter 20. Look at this. Look at this. We're about done. Okay. This is the, the big point here. Okay. And after he gives him his law, okay, the Ten Commandments, the governing principles of his kingdom, the law of love, righteousness, okay. We come down and look at verse 24 and look at what God does here. You maybe probably have never seen this before. Take a look. An altar of the earth. Say amen if you're with me. You there? An altar of the earth you shall make for me and you, and you shall sacrifice it, your burnt offering, and your peace offering, your sheep and your oxen, and every place where I record my name, I will come to you and I will bless you. Let's stop there, right? So God had said that the sacrificial system that you're going to do, this animal is to be sacrificed, right? And again, we know that this unblemished animal pointed us to who? To Jesus, right? When John the Baptist saw Christ, behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world, right? Look what he says. But when you build the altar, when you build the what? The altar, and then you place the, the sacrifice on it, he then gives him specific instructions on what not to do to the altar that's holding the sacrifice. Take a look. Verse 25, he then says, And if you make me an altar of stone, look at this, you shall not build it of hewn stone, he says, for if you use your tool on it, you have profaned it. What is God saying? Look at this. It's incredible. When you build the altar, what's going to be placed on the altar? Sacrifice. Who points us to who? To Christ. He then says, don't you dare do anything to this altar. Because if you, if you, if you take out your chisel and you take out your, your hammer or whatever it is and you're ching, 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 and ching, ching, and wait, you know what? I want to make this a little nicer. I don't like the way this looks. And I want to chisel it here and put it here. He says, you're going to defile it. What is he trying to tell us? I have it here on the screen. Look at this. This is incredible. There is nothing we can add to God's sacrifice. We just trust in it. If we try to add something to it, we defile it. God was telling them, if you fix up the altar and make it all quote-unquote pretty, the focus turns from the sacrifice to the altar you did. It's not about you and what you do. It's about the sacrifice and what God did. You see what God's doing? So if you build the altar and you begin to do your little touches to it, you've defiled it. Because what you do just defiles. Leave it alone and just trust in what the sacrifice is to represent. And don't touch anything. Just have faith in what it means. Can you say amen? Because if you touch it, you're going to do what? You'll defile it. How do we apply that then to salvation? Same is true of salvation. At the cross, which the sacrifice represented, Jesus paid it all, and there is nothing we can do to add to salvation. We just trust in it. If we try to add to it, we defile it. You guys are asleep. Christ was trying to show his people, even way back then, 
that you and I could add nothing to salvation and what the sacrifice represented. Because if we try to add to it, we defile it. Just trust in it and glory in God in it. You and I cannot add to our salvation. We're going to defile it. Just trust in it and praise God for it. Right? For salvation is through the Lamb alone. And this was the teaching that God was trying to tell his people as he led them out. Hey, you spent 400 years. Let me tell you something. Let me introduce to you who I am again, that I am your deliverer and your God, and salvation is what I'm going to do for you, and you can do nothing to it. If you do something, you defile it. Anything you do, you defile it. Just trust in it. Trust in me as, my, as the Savior. And when Christ came as the Lamb of God and hung on the cross there, he's once again saying, don't add nothing to this. I've paid it all for you. Do you guys see that there, what he's trying to teach? So in verse 26, last verse. Once again, verse 25, and if you make me an altar of stone, you shall not build it of hewn stone, for if you use your tool on it, you have profaned it. Okay, we know what that means. Verse 26, nor shall you go up by steps to my altar that your nakedness may not be exposed to it. What is God saying? When they built the altar, okay, it was up here, and they would have some steps at, so, what God is saying is, is don't, don't, don't make steps. Don't make what? So you can begin to go up to the sacrifice. First of all, in those days, right, they all sort of wore, I don't want to say skirts, but they wore, right? So if you were down here worshiping and somebody was climbing up here and you look up, what's going to happen? You're going to see their nakedness, God said, right? Okay. I don't, I don't want you to come up to me to think that, don't forget, I came down to you. God did what? He came down. He says, I'm not calling you up in regards to you doing something here, don't forget, I initiated it, God said, and I came down to you. And he descended on the mountain. Who is the bread from heaven who came down to us to save us? Jesus. Jesus, God becomes flesh, comes down and saves mankind. Don't you touch it. Don't you touch this altar. Don't you think that you can add, you just trust in it. If you touch it, you defile it. Don't come up to me in that way. Mm -mm. I've come down to you. Isn't God good? Sometimes I think that we take our worship too lightly and not reverent enough. God is holy. We are sinners. Last slide here. While we were still enemies, Christ died for us, the Bible says. Look at this. This plan of salvation was set in place, not dependent on what the people would do, but on God's great love, mercy, and compassion for you and me. So when we partake in communion this Sabbath, I want you to keep in your mind that when you partake of this body that represents the body of Jesus, when you partake of this grape juice or unfermented wine that, partake, that symbolizes his blood, you can say, Lord, I thank you that I'm not here to chisel this. I'm not here to add anything. Right? I'm not here to chisel this altar. Are you with me? I'm just here to know that I have nothing to add, that salvation is through the Lamb and him alone and I will rejoice in it and remember in this 
as I partake in communion today. Amen? When we partake in the Lord's Supper, remember that you and I cannot add anything to anything. We just trust in the salvation that God has given us, that he has come down to save his people. Amen? Amen. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for being with us, Lord, today. And Lord, I thank you for this beautiful truth that you had to remind your people after so many years who you were, who you are. You never change. And Lord, how you brought your very own throne down to this mountain, gave them your governing principles, the commandments, and then of course said, let me tell you something right now. When you build this altar here, don't you dare add anything to it, you're just going to defile it. And don't you make steps and come up. Lord, you came down. Anything we try to do, dear God, will defile. May what our lives reflect, may it be a gratitude and a love for our Savior and just trusting in your salvation that we are saved by the blood of the Lamb. Amen. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.